Environment Program on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host for this afternoon, Maureen Nandini Mitra. As some of you may know, October 23rd marked the five-year anniversary of a massive natural gas leak at Southern California Gas Company's storage facility in the San Fernando Valley. The Aliso Canyon leak, as it is known, lasted 111 days and was finally capped on February 18, 2016. By then, it had spewed about 100,000 tons of methane into the atmosphere making it the largest natural gas leak disaster ever recorded in the U.S., and the first time a methane leak was visible from space. The blowout led to the evacuation of 8,000 families, approximately 25,000 people. Many suffered immediate health symptoms, including headaches, nosebleeds, rashes. Many others, including pets and wild animals, too, suffered far more serious long-term impacts, including cancers, Uh, that in some cases led to death. Before Governor Jerry Brown left office in 2017, he directed the California Energy Commission to plan for a 10-year shutdown timeline for the facility. When Gavin Newsom took it a step further during his election campaign, promising to fast-track the shutdown. But despite all these promises, Aliso Canyon has ramped up by some 3,000% compared to Governor Brown's last two years in office. I mean, wrapped up usage of the facility. How did this happen? To give us an update on the situation, I have with me today Matt Pakuko, president and co-founder of Safe Porter Ranch, a local citizens group that broke news about the leak back in 2015. The group was originally formed to oppose fracking in the region, but has since been on the front lines of tracking the blowout and its impacts among local residents, as well as pushing for action from the government. Um, I'm also supposed to have another guest. Um, oh, I believe we just got her. Um, this is, uh, I have also Alexandra Negi, California Director of Food and Water Watch, an organization that focuses on co- corporate and government accountability relating to food, water, climate, and corporate overreach in the U.S. Food and Water Watch, too, has been advocating for the shutdown of the Eloiso Canyon facility. Alexandra, Matt, welcome to Terra Verde. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Thanks for having us. Hi, <laughs> Matt, uh, if we could start with you. When we had spoken uh, earlier, you had uh, talked about how the blowout was no accident. Could you elaborate on that and also uh, give some idea of how close to the facility you live? Yeah, um, I live about 700 feet from the edge of that facility. So I got a front row seat, front row seat to this whole gas blowout. And about less than a mile, the actual blown out well. But, you know, that distance almost doesn't matter because that gas went for, you know, the health department says 12 miles in pretty much all directions. So, Right. Um, so what, why do you say it was an accident waiting to happen? Oh, because there was every kind of issue with that facility. Um, let me start with a list. In 2014... SoCal Gas, um, they did their own uh, survey of their facility, and they found out that there was a, uh, they, call, they called it a negative well integrity trend, which means the facility was deteriorating, and they needed to uh, fix it. So they put in for a rate increase to the Public Utilities Commission that was denied, and SoCal Gas did not do their due diligence to uh, start with, you know, to do their own maintenance, paying for it out of their own pocket, like any, you know, well-run company should. Um, I think same same year, um, we had a whistleblower that divulged this information. He said, he, he's OCAL gas a manager. He put forward a uh, memo, internal email that said, because that all the wells in that gas facility transact the uh, Santa Susana fault line, which is capable of, I think, 7.0, it is, it's an active fault. Because they all transact that fault line, that if that fault line moved a certain amount, it could shear every gas well they have simultaneously. And in his words, there could be a um, catastrophic loss of life and a 
fireball, uh, a fireball of uh, a potential for catastrophic loss of life and a firestorm of unimaginable proportion, unimaginable proportion. That's their word. Um, prior to the gas blowout, um, well, here, let's go to the Blade Report, the investigation of the uh, of the blowout itself, which was commissioned by the state of California by a third party called Blade Energy Partners. Matt. Let's let's get to that later because I want to first uh, address the blowout, if that's all right. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to um, ask uh, Alexandra if you can take this. You know, why was the impact of the blowout, you know, so extensive? Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, my understanding is um, exposure to methane in low levels can um, is usually not like terribly harmful to people, but in this case, we are we are talking about uh, a lot of health impacts, right? Absolutely, and this this methane gas blowout was not just methane. So that was the first kind of misconception put out there by SoCal Gas, telling everyone this is not a harmful incident and posed no threat to public health because it was just methane. But they failed to disclose that there were other chemicals associated with natural gas like carcinogens, you have benzene, formaldehyde, toluene, xylenes, ethyl benzenes, the kind of typical BTEX compounds as they're known associated with, with natural gas. Um, and the other major health risk to the community was that this underground gas storage facility is actually an old oil field. And so they store very uh, a lot of gas under extremely high pressure in an abandoned oil field, and when the gas was pushed out from this blowout, along with it came unrefined crude oil. And that crude oil rained down on the community for four months. So you were uh, seeing small particulate drops of crude oil on playgrounds, cars, pools, pets, um, and people were breathing in this, this fine particulate matter for a very long time. And so all of these issues together um, and then a whole host uh, after the blowout, we found out that there were heavy, heavy metals associated, um, radioactive chemicals like uranium, um, heavy metals like nickel were associated with this gas blowout. And a lot of it SoCal Gas knew about, but they, they really worked to cover this up quickly and just dismissed all of the health concerns when in reality people were getting seriously ill and many people and pets in fact died during this disaster. And because it was such an unprecedented release that took place over 111 days, really the harm to the community still today is not quantifiable. Um, and that facility is still leaking every day and continues to release those dangerous chemicals in the nearby community. Right. Matt, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what kind of health impacts you and your partner have been suffering and what? Is it what's the most serious health impact you have heard of or seen in these five years? Well, the most serious one is rare cancers that have crept up on the blowout and much more after the blowout. Cancers that are only or they're pretty much um, associated with exposure to certain chemicals and toxins and carcinogens. And there's a, a cluster of them in this area. Which you know is, is is not is beyond the statistical norm. So, um, and, and myself, and from so many people I've talked to, and so many people on our social media, the, the some of the some of the more common health problems are are regular nosebleeds, heart palpitations, breathing issues, skin rashes, and these things will happen. You know, people have left this area, moved out of this area because of health problems, and other people, they'll leave the area for, like, vacation or a long length of time, and these symptoms will go away. And almost like clockwork, when they return to the area, these symptoms will return. And myself, I have heart palpitations frequently from this facility, and when they're really bad, I leave my house and drive two, three miles away. And guess what? They just magically disappear. Um, so I'll stay away for several hours before I come back because whatever is in the air, you know, eventually it blows into someone else's house in another direction. There's canyons up here. 
and the and the wind blows in you know different directions depending on where you live is how bad you you'll be exposed. So yeah, that's just a a small sampling of the regular ones that we hear about the most. Hello. Hello. I don't hear anybody. Where'd everybody go? I'm here. Is she not there? I don't know. Are we on commercial break? Sorry, did we lose hey. everyone? It Man, seems here. like it. Oh, everyone's here. Too. Hello. Sorry, I think there was a glitch at the radio station or maybe on my end. Um, but I was uh, just asking you, Matt, um, have you considered moving from the area given that you've been suffering so much? We have looked at how we could move out of here, but there has been uh, so much financial damage to us because of this blowout and the fact that my business actually a facility built in my home. I can't just move it and then certainly right. can't afford to rebuild it. We can't afford to rebuild it anywhere. I would move in a second if any plausible opportunity came. Sorry to hear that. Oh. So I hear oh. that oh, me, SoCal me, uh, Gas has reached a $120 million settlement with the city, county, and state to fund, among other things, an in-depth health study. Um, and uh, but the, it, there seems to be some distrust among the community about the study and what its outcomes uh, will produce. Alex, could you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think from day one of this disaster, we were not getting the support that we needed from the local county Department of Public Health um, here in Los Angeles around this. They were really towing the gas company line for a very long time that that the health effects were minimal and that what people were experiencing were mere annoyances. And, and they asserted, as the gas company did, that there would be no long-term health effects. And the community was outraged. There have been a series of um, missteps by L.A. County Department of Public Health, one was uh, one of the key physicians um, sent a letter to all area doctors telling them not to do toxicology tests. And if patients were coming in in droves, uh, sick with the types of symptoms we were seeing during the blowout, to look for any other reason um, aside from the gas blowout. Look at the gas blowout as being a last you know, resort of why people are getting sick. And so it really misdirected a lot of doctors and their ability to um, work directly with patients and, and get to the bottom of why people were getting so sick. And mm -hmm. this is the same agency that is still in charge of this $25 million health study. And there have been really efforts in the last two years since this money has been allocated to get a community advisory group where there are many amazing leaders from the community on this on this group who are trying to steer the Department of Public Health in an independent direction um, to move away from these serious missteps and ways that they lost uh, trust from the community. Um, and, and there are so many more, I'm, I'm telling you. So th this has really been a long effort, and the health study it still isn't even started, and here we are five years later, and it just makes a retrospective study like this very difficult. And when they've already lost the community's trust, um, even more uh, challenging. And so the community is calling for a fully independent health study where the, the best science and the best experts are brought to bear for this um, who are not associated or affiliated with the politics that have been so easily tainted by get the gas company and SoCal Gas's money and power and influence. So there's a lot at stake right. here, and $25 million is a lot of money to also squander and right. uh, 
the the big fear right now is, you know, will twenty five million dollars just be used to further cover up what's been going on in the community? Um, I have to interrupt you here to reintroduce the show. This is Maureen, and you're tuned into Terra Verde, a weekly environment radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Today, we are talking about the ongoing impacts of the October 2015 Aliso Canyon Natural Gas Leak. With me are Matt Pakuko of Safe Porter Ranch and Alexandra Nagy of Food and Water Watch. All right, so... How come use of the facility has wrapped up after all these flaws that you all are pointing out? Who wants to take that? Well, I'm going to do a quick correction. It was not a natural gas leak. It was a polytoxin gas blowout. And when people say natural gas leak, that makes it sound you know, like la di da, like somebody farted. Neutral. No, it was a right. it was a chemical it was a chemical disaster basically. Thank you for correcting yeah, and that. I- Yeah, and as to why the use of this facility has ramped up, it really points back to the regulators and our government being captured by SoCal Gas's money and power and and, and lobbyists. And immediately following this blowout, um, Aliso Canyon was pretty much deemed unsafe. And for two years, it was shut in and barely used, um, whereas it was prior to the blowout, it was used almost on a daily basis. Two years after the blowout, it was hardly used at all. And it was really proven that it was not needed to meet energy reliability. And that made SoCal Gas very unhappy because they make a lot of money out of storing gas in their fields for third-party customers. They make money on the trading, and then the facility itself is worth hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of assets in their balance sheet and makes their shareholders a lot of money. So what they've been doing for the last two years since Governor Newsom was elected was they've been skirting the rules and going around certain regulations to move away from the rules that were put in place that helped us get off of the Lisa Canyon to weakening those rules over time. And so we've seen a 3,000% increase in withdrawals from the facility and, and SoCal Gas is trying to justify all this by saying, hey, look, see, we told you Elisa Canyon really is needed to meet demand. Uh, when we proved previously that wasn't true. And the Newsom administration really is allowing SoCal Gas to get away with this. And the public utilities commissioners are going along and have really been captured and are turning a blind eye to SoCal Gas's abuse and market manipulation and really supply manipulation uh, down to the bottom of it that allows Mm. them to kind of make these justifications. And we've been calling them out on this, but really the Public Utilities Commission just continues to sit on their hands. And even though Governor Newsom has promised many times in last year, he issued a letter to the PUC saying, I want you to expedite this shutdown plan. Um, you know, he's not actually stepping out and leading. And so he, too, is being silent and deferential to SoCal Gas and their parent company, Semper Energy. And when you look at the, the records, you know, Governor Newsom, while campaigning for his office, took $32,000 from Semper Energy. Um, so we, we really need Governor Newsom to step in here um, to rein in the Public Utilities Commission to stand up to SoCal Gas. And, and he can do that by stopping these unnecessary withdrawals and unnecessary use and putting a plan in place, a, a full timeline to get this place shut down. Um, and, and he right. can do this with the stroke of his pen. Mm-hmm. Matt, when I'd spoken to you earlier, you'd also cited, along with earthquake risk, a fire risk as a looming threat to the facility. Could you explain that a little bit more, given the location of the go- facility and all that? It kind of goes without saying, uh, gas and oil and fire don't mix very well. Right. Um, so there's been, uh, they started their own fire a couple of years ago with some accident they had. Then two brush fires in the last like two and a half years have gone through that facility. And what really disturbs us is the number of uh, fire department resources that go up to that facility to obviously protect the facility from blow into kingdom come. And while they're up there, they're not down in our our neighborhood protecting houses. So we had one street, which borders the canyon in a different direction. We lost a lot of houses were uh, burned. Uh, On that street, 
while there were, you know, I don't know, dozens, hundred fire trucks up protecting the SoCal gas facility from that, um, what they call the uh, fireball from hell or whatever I said before. Um, so that kind of, that's kind of a no-brainer. Fire, oil, and gas are a bad mixture. And that places in what is called uh, in uh, L.A., in this area, a um, high fire risk or a very high fire zone. risk zone. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Alexandra, you have uh, mentioned before that Aliso Canyon isn't just a health crisis, but also a climate crisis, a catastrophe. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, there are about, you know, 400 of these underground gas storage facilities across the United States. And Aliso Canyon is the fourth largest in the country. And on its own is just a super polluter, according to the EPA, um, is the third largest uh, polluter of gas storage facilities in the U.S. And the amount of methane that comes out of that storage facility just from normal operations is a huge threat to our climate. Methane is 84 times more polluted, uh, potent than carbon dioxide at trapping uh, heat and warming the planet in a short time frame of 20 years. And then when it was, you know, the home, Elisa Kenny was the home of the largest methane disaster in U.S. history. You know, that one blowout leak alone accounted for roughly 20 to 25 percent of California's methane emissions for the year. And five years later, we're, we're only... Um, a quarter of the way through that sort of supercharging, uh, climate accelerating time frame of 20 years. And so this is, this is still going to have a tremendous impact. It, it leaked a hundred and thousand, uh, 100,000 metric tons of methane, um, during the course of that blowout. Um, and it's just, it's going to have horrible impacts on the wildfires that we're seeing in Northern California. You know, this is all exacerbated by our addiction to fossil fuels and our refusal to quickly uh, shut down these types of very polluting, very dangerous uh, pieces of fossil fuel infrastructure and transition to clean energy. And so we have a, a major responsibility to do this, not only at Elisa Canyon, but at the 13 other gas storage facilities in California and, uh, you know, all the other fossil fuel infrastructure and the like. So we really see Elisa Canyon as being kind of the tip of the spear in terms of um, shutting down infrastructure that's really threatening Californians today and what we're seeing today with the climate apocalypse. Um, it's only going to get worse if we don't act. And starting to, with shutting down Elisa Canyon is, is a clear first step, given how dangerous it is and its record in California so far. Right. And on the other hand, our governor has also just recently issued several new fracking permits, which would then produce gas that would then be stored in these facilities, right? Absolutely. Yeah, this uh, Elisa Canyon storage facility and all the storage facilities in California are storing fracked gas. And so this is coming from across the western United States. And, you know, the gas we burn in our power plants or, or run through our pipelines is all coming from fracking. And so we have a really big responsibility to, you know, stop fracking, ban fracking, stop drilling for oil, especially in California. We say we're a green leader and that we're a climate leader, but Newsom has time and time again failed on this, especially where he's promised to do the right thing, like shut down Aliso Canyon or ban fracking. What that really means is the opposite. The, the use of these things ramp up according to his record. So it's a very frustrating position to be in where, the marketing of California is so pervasive, but the reality is very dark and sinister. And that's what we're challenged with as well. How do we really educate people to how bad, you know, Newsom's own record on these issues are and work to hold him accountable on these massive statewide issues? Right. We have only a few minutes left, but I do want to quickly touch upon the uh, numerous lawsuits uh, against the company that have been filed on behalf of some 36,000 plaintiffs. Matt, are you one of those plaintiffs? Of course, and so is uh, Save Porter Ranch. Right. Um, can can one of you, maybe Matt, can you give uh, us an update about uh, what's happening with those lawsuits? Well, 
even without the COVID delay, SoCal Gas has pulled out every, you know, every possible delay they can attempt to pull out in this uh, whole court battle. And they've got like, you know, 30,000 people suing them. It's a mass tort um, type of case. They have blocked every kind of uh, deposition. They have blocked every kind of evidence. They have, and they have lost in many of these attempts, and the judge has seen through it all. Um, and they keep trying. They, right now, they're trying to keep their uh, Jerry Brown's sister, who uh, was on the board of Sempra during the blowout, in charge of uh, environment and uh, safety, by the way. <laughs> trying to keep her from testifying. So that, that's going to court. They're trying to keep uh, Sempra Energy from being at all liable for the blowout. Oh, and saying, oh, we're not responsible for SoCal Gas's issues, which is, they'll lose that one, but they have to try it. And and every every kind of blockade they can try. Um, and it's funny, that stuff hasn't even gone near a court, you know, court, uh, near trial yet. But the city, the county, and the state, in all their lawsuits, they've already settled, um, and they've all moved on. They got their $119 million, and they've moved on. $119 million to Sempra Energy is if I contaminate the entire is San Fernando Valley and, you know, in proportion, I would, that's like me paying $750 to settle the claim. So there's nothing for SoCal gas. There's, there's no, um, there's no, uh, right. nothing to keep them from doing this again. That's so minuscule. So basically you all are waiting for a court date on at least one, some of the cases. Oh yeah. And it's great. The uh, attorney general Becerra and the announcement of that settlement, he said, this does not affect um, anybody's personal injury lawsuits. So you guys should continue with that. Essentially, it's telling him, him telling us, he's our lawyer for the state. He's telling us, uh, go get a lawyer after he signs off on everything and walks away. Sorry to hear that. Well, um, I am assuming you're, you both will keep the pressure on to make the state government come through and set up a direct timeline to close down this uh, facility. Um, but that's all we really have time for on today's show. And I apologize for the earlier interruption. Uh, to learn more about Safe Water Ranch, go to safewaterranch.com. To read up on Food and Water Watch's work on this issue, go to foodandwaterwatch.org. Thank you, Alexandra and Matt, for joining us today to shed light on this other ongoing massive public health crisis in California that we really hear about. Uh, um, this Thank show so and others us. will be available to you on kpfa.org for your convenience. Alexandra, Matt, thank, it was a pleasure having you. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks to our engineer for helping host this show. And have thank a good you. weekend. Bye. 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 Hey, don't trade it for peanuts. Donate your old car to KPFA and get the full tax write-off. Vehicle donations are a win-win for everyone. They're the perfect way to support KPFA. Put your unwanted car, boat, motorhome, or truck to good use. It's easier than selling it, and you'll get a tax receipt for your records. Donating your vehicle to KPFA is really easy, and it only takes three steps. One. Have your VIN number and the title to your car handy. Call the Car Donation Center at 877-411-3662 or fill out the Donate Now form online at kpfa.org to schedule a convenient time to pick up your vehicle. Three. Give the tow truck driver your signed title and, of course, the keys. And that's it. When your vehicle sells, you'll receive a thank you letter and an IRS tax form 1098. Thank you for supporting community-powered KPFA.